Well, um, on behalf of my tech, I want to welcome everybody to this incredible tour today of the Breakers um, in the Newport Mansions uh, in Newport, Rhode Island. We're absolutely thrilled to have this talk today with so much interest from the MIT community, just leaps and bounds beyond what we ever thought. Um, and uh, we're joined today by Jim Donahue, uh, curator of the historic landscapes at the Preservation Society of Newport County. And today he's gonna bring us to the first floor of the Mr. and Mrs. Cornelius Vanderbilt Breakers Mansion um, that was uh, built in 1895. And uh, as a postscript to this Mount Rhode Island for many years. And so we're thrilled to bring this beautiful tour, majestic tour today to everybody, um, allowing many more people to attend than um, a bus can can ever fill, can ever um, hold. <laughs> so, uh, and Shirley Ensminger has been uh, on our committee, has really helped out with, with the Newport um, Mansions holiday tours in the past. So I wanna thank Shirley very much. So uh, Jim, on that note, um, we're thrilled to have you join us. And if you can uh, take us away on the beauty and the magic and the majesty of the Newport Mansions and the Breakers. Thank you, Diane. And thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. I'm not sure any of us will ever get on a bus tour again after what we've been through. <laughs> but uh, this is, I think, a preferable way of doing it at this point. So the Preservation Society of Newport County um, has 12 properties, uh, seven of which are historic, national historic landmarks, the Breakers being one of them. And uh, it is our premier property. For the last 30 years or so, we have been decorating the houses for the holidays. And this year, uh, due to shortages of staff and such, we're only doing two houses fully decorated, the Breakers and the Elms. So uh, even though you're seeing the Breakers today, I hope at some point you get a chance to come down and see the Elms perhaps, which is open until January 3rd. And the Breakers, uh, which I'll be showing you today, is open until January 10th, every day from noon to 8 p.m. Um, I'm going to move on. As Diane mentioned, the home uh, was built by Cornelius Vanderbilt II. On the left, there is a portrait by John Singer Sargent, which hangs at the Breakers of Mr. Vanderbilt. And on the right is his wife, Alice Claypool Gwynn Vanderbilt. And uh, she also is hanging on the landing of the Grand Stair at the Breakers. The house was built in 1895. It was designed by Richard Morris Hunt, the premier architect of the day, of the Gilded Age. Um, and he considered this one of his premier, probably it's one of his greatest uh, pieces of work, sort of his masterpiece that came along very late in his life. He only lived a few years after the house was completed. However, it was not the first house on this site. There was a Breakers before the current Breakers, uh, which was built in 1870s by Pierre Lorillard. And the reason I bring this up is because there is an MIT connection. Um, the house that predates the current breakers was designed by Peabody and Stearns, but the landscape was designed by an MIT graduate, Ernest Bowditch. Here's Ernest. Uh, Ernest William Bowditch was in the first graduating class of MIT, which was at the time Boston Technical College, I believe. He didn't actually graduate, don't tell anyone. I think he did three years. He um, majored in chemistry and mining. And at that time, there was no formal educational program in landscape architecture. And he really was one of the founding fathers of landscape architecture in the United States. He was a contemporary of the Olmsted brothers and competed with them for many of the commissions that he eventually won. Uh, Bowditch really specialized in very upscale estate era um, Vanderbilt type properties, whereas the Olmsteads did much more park work, although Bowditch was known for a lot of his early subdivisions, which became popular in the late 19th century. So he did projects all throughout the United States. Um, maybe someday I'll come back and speak to you about Ernest Bowditch. I've done a lot of research about him. He was quite a character. Um, his practice really died along with him. He had no partners in his practice. Um, so he is not as well known as the Olmsteads, although his body of work actually surpassed the number uh, completed by Frederick Law Olmsted. So that first house uh, designed by P.B. and Stearns and with a landscape by Ernest Bowditch 
actually burned to the ground uh, the day after Thanksgiving in 1892. At that point, it was owned by Cornelius Vanderbilt, who bought the house, I think it was in 1885 or seven, don't quote me on that, 1880s. Um, after the house burnt down, he immediately hired Richard Morris Hunt to redesign the house. And believe it or not, it only took two years to rebuild the house on the exact same site. However, um, Cornelius Vanderbilt gave the stricture to Hunt that the house could not really go much outside the previous envelope, the previous foundation of the other house. It's much larger than the other house, but he didn't want um, Hunt to touch the landscape that Bowditch had already established now for like 20 years. So the house was inserted into a pre-existing landscape um, and then Bowditch came back after the house was completed and reworked the landscape to suit the more, the high formality of the house. The house is considered um, Northern Italian Genovese Palace or Piazza in style. It is modeled on such homes, although it's much more voluminous. Um, an original Northern Italian Piazza would have had um, an open air interior courtyards, and this is a completely enclosed house. Um, so you'll see that as we walk through, many modifications were made because of the temperate climate here in Newport. But one of the biggest events in terms of the history of the breakers was the hurricane of 1938, in which the Bowditch landscape was largely destroyed. Over 125 trees were lost in that hurricane. Um, and so from that time forward, uh, the landscape was never the same. I am curator of landscapes here at the Preservation Society. I'm not an interiors curator. I don't know about um, deck arts or furniture or as much about architecture as other curators may, but one of the reasons I'm talking to you today is that I also am in charge of decorating the houses for Christmas and the winter months. So it's my project and that's why I'm doing the holiday tour. Um, you'll be happy to know that the Bowditch landscape is currently undergoing a multi-year, multi-million dollar restoration. Uh, we have already gotten through phase one, which opened about 18 months ago. This is a rendering by Reed Hildebrand Landscape Architects, also in Cambridge, Mass. Um, of the northwest quadrant of the garden, which looks very much now like the rendering. So I hope even if you only see the virtual tour today that you will actually come down and visit not only the house, but the landscape, uh, which is really quite an accomplishment, especially in its reworked state. Um, and this year we have something very special going on. Since the governor of Rhode Island asked us to move as much as we could outdoors due to the COVID pandemic, uh, we've actually, for the first time, lit up the outdoor landscape at the Breakers. I'm not going to be showing you that today. It leaves something for the imagination. Also leaves you a reason to visit in person. Uh, but we are calling it Sparkling Lights at the Breakers. And that is the Ernest Bowditch landscape. The parts that have been completed um, as part of the master plan are now all lit up uh, outdoors. And that's been quite popular because it is a COVID safe event. You can tour both the interior of the house and the exterior grounds. Um, at your own leisure, we do it all COVID safe with social distancing and et cetera, et cetera. So before we move on to the digital 3D uh, tour, um, I wanted to introduce Sebastian Dutton. Sebastian is a research fellow here at the Preservation Society. He's in his second year. He was so good the first year, we kept him for a second year. And over the first uh, year of his stay here, he actually did a number of Matterport 3D digitizations of our other houses, which do actually appear on our website under the Learn tab or the Explore tab. I'm not sure. No, it's on our website, uh, newportmansions.org. So after you see today's holiday tour of the Breakers, you can actually go to our website and see some of our other properties as well. So I'm going to literally turn my chair over to Sebastian. He's going to open up the Matterport presentation and explain to you how he goes about creating such a thing. So I'll be back. Don't worry. <laughs> Give you Sebastian Dutton. Hello. So I am going to stop the screen share for a minute. And I'm just going to talk about how I capture the interior space. So I use the, the Matterport program, software, hardware. Uh, anyone who's looked at uh, real estate recently has probably looked at virtual tours. Most oftentimes those are done by Matterport. So I use their proprietary camera, which is a camera has an array of lenses and infrared sensors that rotate on a tripod. Uh, it captures 360 degrees, 
horizontally and 300 degrees vertically. Uh, it's an interface on an iPad that controls all of it. So you place the tripod, press the button, the camera does a rotation, you move it you know, three to 10 feet, depending on the space and do it again. And it just kind of fills out the space as you're going along. And it's kind of like, it's very similar to photogrammetry in the way that it works, except for you're not having to do all the stitching of the images together. Uh, once you capture the entire space, you simply upload it to their platform and they do the processing online. And within about 24 hours, you get the, the completed model. Using their proprietary camera, the data that's captured is accurate within 1% of reality. They offer other cameras. You can use a, a Leica for exterior captures accurate within 0.1% or some of the external 360 cameras are like four to 8% of reality. Once it's uploaded and processed and you have the model, you can download OBJ files so you can export them to external operations and use the 3D models there. You can create floor plans from it with accurate dimensions, among other things. So what I'm going to do is start a screen share and pull up the model and kind of show you some of the things with the model before the tour begins. So here is the model. So once it's done, it creates this dollhouse view that you can then move around, manipulate, zoom in and out and see all the different spaces. You can also get a floor plan view and you can see all of the captured space. So this is not the entire house. I only scan the parts that are included in the, the tour and you can choose individual floors and see within those spaces. Another thing is the measurement mode and you can actually measure objects and items within the space. And while it wasn't done with this tour, you can insert any sort of interpretation be it video, audio, text, images directly into the tour attached to the objects because of the way that it captures the 3D data. And so it's, it's a very versatile platform beyond just being used for real estate. So that's Kind of overall that, so I'm going to switch back over to Jim and let him walk you through the space. Let me move to the entrance of the house. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. Are you going to stick around for questions yeah. and answers? Because I cannot <laughs> answer anything technical yes. in more ways than one. So <laughs> here we are at the vestibule of the breakers. Um, the entire house is clad in Indiana limestone. And one of the reasons it was built so quickly is that it is actually modern construction. It's a steel structure with curtain walls to which the stone is applied. As I mentioned before, it was only two years in construction. And as we go through it, I'm going to explain how they pulled that off. It's quite a technical feat. So we're walking up into the Great Hall. I had said before that this was modeled on a Genovese palace. and that would mean that the space we're entering here would have been an open air courtyard. But in this case, we call it the Great Hall. Its dimensions are 50 by 50 by 50. It's basically a 50 foot cube. And uh, it's completely formal and symmetrical on all four sides. Since this is a Christmas tour, I might as well mention that you're looking directly at um, one of the favorite elements of the Christmas tour, which is the poinsettia tree. As we go through this tour, we're going to pass closer by that. We're going to loop around the house on the first floor and we'll pass it more closely. Um, <clears throat> other elements that are added for Christmas, obviously, are the Christmas trees on the right. Between the two houses this year, the elms and the breakers, I think we installed 28 Christmas trees. Uh, Sebastian was also largely responsible for that as well. All the fellows helped me this year because typically we use about um, 90 volunteer sessions um, of three hours each, you know, four people at a time to get the um, holiday decorations installed. Because of COVID, we were not able to do that this year. We actually used the research fellows to great advantage and they did an awesome job to help us put up all the Christmas trees. So I'm gonna take you on the loop that the actual phone app would take you on if you came in person. And I threw in a bonus floor. Uh, Sebastian also scanned the second floor. So I'm not only gonna show you the first floor, but the second one as well. There are four floors in the breakers. And please excuse my navigating. I as I said to Sebastian earlier, it's like I've had too much eggnog. I'm not the smoothest navigator in Matterport. As we take a left off the Great Hall, I'm going to show you first 
this portrait of Cornelius Vanderbilt II. He built this house. He was the grandson of the Commodore Vanderbilt who founded the family interests in shipping. Uh, we'll see a portrait of the Commodore for the, further along on the tour. The Vanderbilts were something new in American society, uh, multimillionaires. And at the time this house was built, um, the family fortune all combined was probably in excess of $200 million, which in uh, 19th century terms was almost incomprehensible. Uh, I'm not gonna talk a lot about furniture simply because I'm sort of a landscape guy. Um, if you were to come and do the tour using your phone, you'd get a lot more in terms of furniture, interior you know, deco arts and architecture. First room on the left is the breakfast room. Before we enter the breakfast room though, I want to show you this interior hallway because they happen throughout the house. Um, this house has two circulation patterns, one for the residents who used all the public rooms and uh, the primary circulation patterns and one for the servants. And so there are servants hallways throughout the house that mimic the patterns, circulation patterns of the residents. This is just one little extension hall that runs from the foyer uh, to the breakfast room, the butler's pantry, the kitchen and the dining room. Uh, servants could actually navigate through the house without being detected. And that was the whole idea, especially on the bedroom floor. We'll see that next. Breakfast room, like the rest of the house, is done in a very ornate French style. One of the ways that this house was completed in only two years is that the rooms themselves were fabricated in Paris uh, and you know, deconstructed, shipped to the US, and then reconstructed within the shell of the house after the shell was completed. That saved a whole lot of time in terms of house completion, uh, two years in all. This room is paneled in wood in a sage green color with lots of gilding. You'll see going to see a lot of gilding throughout the house. And since this is the breakfast room, the holiday skein, I don't know how close I can get here. Sebastian. Scroll wheel. Scroll wheel. Yes, I can even scroll the wheel on top of the mouse. Okay. Ooh, <laughs> <laughs> the things you learn. Okay, so I just learned how to zoom. So you, you'll be happy about that. Um, so, it's a Williamsburg sort of fruit and flowers sort of theme, which seemed appropriate for a breakfast room and it complements the color of the damask curtains, et cetera, et cetera. We're gonna turn around and look at the fireplace and that carries the same theme. Um, what we do in terms of our house decorations is that we don't have the budget, honestly, to replace everything every year. So what I try to do is improve the scheme by retiring things that might look a little ragged or maybe aren't the best quality with things of higher quality. So over the years, we just improve each room scheme. And then if we think we've done something for too long, we'll move it from one house to the next and rework it, um, which is really the best way for us to approach it. I often get questions about what the theme is for each year. And the theme really doesn't change. The theme for me is to get it done. <laughs> um, and we don't like change it to SpongeBob one year and you know <laughs> Disney the next. It's always sort of what the room tells us to do. So we're going to proceed out of the breakfast room back to the great hall. And I wanted to show you the underside of the grand staircase, which we'll see later in the tour. But the grand staircase was actually modeled on the Paris Opera House staircase, um, which features this sort of grotto beneath, which actually has a working fountain, the dolphins within this grotto, the stone dolphins spout water. Um, as I mentioned, this was an indoor outdoor house. Um, the central courtyard is enclosed, but the idea was that in the summertime, when the Vanderbilts were in residence, because this was just a summer house that they spent six to eight months, six to eight weeks in, in August and September, um, the idea was that it would be a very much indoor outdoor experience. And this fountain actually um, causes sort of a, a watery effect throughout the Great Hall. The echoes of the fountain make it feel more of an outdoor space. So we're going to move into the formal state dining room. Again, this room was completely constructed in France and shipped to the United States uh, and reassembled. The chandeliers and all the sconces are Baccarat crystal. And although it's hard to see in this photo, I think we'll see it better probably in the music room. Um, all of the chandeliers are actually not only electric, but they are piped for gas as well. Seems a little bit sketchy to me to have gas and electric in the same fixture, but they didn't trust electricity all that much in 1895, and so they had the gas as a backup. They also thought that gas light was more flattering um, to the diners and the residents of the house. So 
Um, that isn't something that we really saw carried into the 20th century. The columns in this room are solid alabaster. And throughout the house, you're going to see many different types of marble. Um, the base of the columns are Cipollino marble from uh, Switzerland, I believe. But also, when they could not uh, find a piece of marble or get a large enough piece of marble to do something, they would faux paint. And the actual hood above this mantelpiece is faux painting. I know that because I've been up there to decorate, put up the Christmas decorations. So it's very cleverly used throughout um, the house when necessary. The table itself um, can be expanded to seat 40 people. You can see all the chairs around the perimeter of the room. And you can also see all the French doors um, around the perimeter. This room in, in particular would have opened up into the rose garden. Um, it is no longer a rose garden today because the space has been shaded by large trees. But um, the idea is that you could open up all the doors and smell the roses and feel the Atlantic breezes. This wall with a large planter on it at the end is actually the Atlantic side. Um, so whenever we're looking towards that wall, we're looking towards the Atlantic. And looking back towards the grotto under the stairs, there's a large plate glass window that allows you to see the fountain from the dining room, which is a very sort of contemporary way for 1895 of treating the space. So after a formal dinner, it was typical that the male guests, the gentlemen, would retire to the billiards room, which was adjacent to the dining room. This room was completely designed, all of its um, mosaic, by Richard Morris Hunt, the architect. It is thousands and thousands and thousands of marble tiles, all configured into um, very nautical sort of seaside themes. Let's see if I can, whoops. I just want to see if I can zoom into the ceiling for you. Throughout this room, you'll see dolphins um, in all the corners. You'll see dolphins. These are actually dolphins on either side of the scallop shells. In the center, uh, there's a mythological mural with a little turtle. We always ask the guests to try and find the turtle in this room, which is um, very tiny for the size of the room. And then on the floor, also mosaic tile, the motif is acorns. And acorns are on the Vanderbilt coat of arms, and acorns are throughout the house and all the decoration. In the center of the room is the billiards table, of course, that is the original billiards table. And there's a suite of furniture with leather chairs and velvet sofas, also part of the original suite of furniture. The light fixture in the center of the room is so massive that it actually is tied into the structure, the steel structure of the house. Um, because it's because it's because of its weight, it's wrought iron and bronze, and quite substantial. I think the nicest part of this room, I'm going to move around to the side of the billiards table and look back, is the mantelpiece. Whoops, going the wrong way. And again, you'll see alabaster stone, which is sort of translucent. You can't really see it here, but there is a large V. Vanderbilt um, carved into the center portion of that mantelpiece. So this is a very manly masculine room for all the gentlemen who would play billiards after dinner. The walls also are Cipollino marble from Switzerland and they're book matched and everything old is sort of new again and book matching is really big right now in contemporary, you know, higher end homes where the backsplashes are, you know, book matched marble. They were doing it in 1895 long before people were doing it today. So we're going to move back out into the Great Hall. I'm not the best navigator in this. I'm, I'm sure Sebastian's probably cringing as I do this. I'm very like a toddler. Let's go this way. Um, so we're back into the Great Hall. I want to turn around and look at the poinsettia tree. This is where many visitors uh, take their Christmas card photos. This is about 150 poinsettias, live poinsettias, uh, all stacked up in a pyramid on their sides. Um, and more than anything, this is a maintenance item. Our grounds department uh, constructs this every year and it is deconstructed and redone three times, usually over the course of the holiday season. The poinsettias being in the Great Hall in the dark sort of on their sides only last about two weeks and it's on display for about six weeks. So we go through about 450 poinsettias just for this one item alone. I think overall we use about 1500 poinsettias uh, for our houses and many of those are grown in our own greenhouses. 
Uh, this gets disassembled and watered every Friday and put back together before the house opens at noontime. I also want to turn around and show you the lower loggia. Um, you don't see much. This must have been early morning. It's sort of dark out there. Storm. Oh, there's a bad storm going on, Sebastian says. So it's sort of dark. But the idea here, again, was that these glass doors would be thrown open during the summer months. And it became an indoor outdoor space. There was this beautiful patio covered by a portico that opened directly onto the Great Hall. And that would have been used for parties and for outdoor drinks, et cetera, et cetera. Um, all of our trees here too, artificial trees, are artificial for the good reason that um, fire code requires that they be artificial. We can't have cut evergreens that would dry out and then, be, then become a fire hazard. We also try whenever possible to use pre-lit trees to save ourselves time. In this case, the lights have failed. And so we actually strung on uh, red lights, which I think are sort of nice because red is the Vanderbilt color. Um, it was used in the day, all of their livery, meaning all of their servants who were in formal attire would wear red velvet with gilt lettering. And so we use a lot of red um, to indicate it's Vanderbilt. Above this doorway, and I know it doesn't show all that well, right up here behind the cherub, there is a locomotive. And that um, is to take note of the Vanderbilt's fortune having been made in shipping and railroads. Their biggest <clears throat> company was the New York Central Railroad, um, which was consolidated from many smaller railroads. It's really where they made the biggest chunk of their fortune. Uh, by the time Cornelius Vanderbilt II uh, took control of the company, the family no longer had controlling interest in the New York Central Railroad. Indeed, it had been um, signed over to a syndicate of men. J. P. Morgan was one of them uh, because it had become so huge that William Vanderbilt, Cornelius', Cornelius his father, thought it was really getting too large for any one person to be responsible for. So the, it had become more of a corporate uh, contemporary structure one of the first really mega corporations in the US. So heading east off the Great Hall, we're entering the morning room as in in the morning before the afternoon. Um, and again, it's a French room, uh, it's all paneled. The insets in the paneling here, which look silvery, you can see them for instance over here, are not in fact silver, they're platinum. And we only found that out about 20 years ago. Platinum was chosen because it does not tarnish all the figures within these panels are Four Seasons. There's a Four Seasons theme, not only in the panels and the walls, but in the seasons, in the ceiling, you have spring, summer, winter, and fall represented in mythological figures. Um, I'm gonna move forward and show you the mirror because I noticed earlier today, there's the scanning apparatus that Sebastian had mentioned earlier. So that's where he would have placed his machinery right there in this sort of dead spot on the floor to scan the room. The Christmas tree itself, we're gonna move up and take a look at that, is um, based on the whole platinum theme. And one of our major restrictions in terms of decorating the house is although these, these rooms are huge, um, I am sort of limited in how large a Christmas tree I can install because we have a very tiny elevator from the, the attic down to these rooms. Most of these trees are 12 feet or nine feet. I'd prefer if they were 15 or 18, but um, really the elevator sort of rules. I don't wanna be carrying things down interior staircases that are you know, massive. Um, to the left, that's the original portrait I had shown you in one of the first slides. That is a John Singer Sargent portrait of Cornelius Vanderbilt from 1895. He actually only had one summer of good health in this house, which was 1895. He shortly thereafter had a stroke and he died by 1897, sort of a sad story. And then the family um, used the house consistently up until about 1938 and very seldom after that until about 1948, at which point it was open to the public with the Preservation Society of Newport County for which we work. Uh, at that point, we didn't own the house. It was loaned to us by the family uh, for the use by the organization. And then in 1971 or two, we bought the house from the family for $400,000, which was you know, an outrageously low amount, basically a donation to us. And on the wall, we pay honor to, this is Countess Sicheni, who is the granddaughter of Cornelius, who uh, owned the house when it was deeded to us. And to the right of that is her husband, 
Count Laszlo Sicheni, who is Hungarian nobility. Um, so we are forever grateful to them for allowing us to have this flagship house within the Preservation Society. So leaving the morning room, we're going to enter the music room. And this is where formal entertainments would have taken place. This room was designed and constructed by Jules Allard in France, and again, shipped and reassembled here in the US. Very high French style. Uh, this is perhaps the most ornate room in the house. Um, and I'm gonna move towards the Christmas tree and show you the mantelpiece, which is pretty amazing as well. So we're gonna turn around to see the mantelpiece. Um, this is all holiday decorations, of course. The candles that you see are battery powered. We cannot have lit candles in a National Historic Landmark and Museum. The furniture is all original. It's of a cut velvet. And again, was from Jules Lard. They were sort of one-stop shopping. They not only did the room paneling and all the carving and light fixtures and draperies and furniture, but they even did the objects, every object within the room. So that also speeded up um, the construction and completion of the house. The Christmas tree itself is really based on the cut velvet curtains and the cut velvet of the upholstery on the furniture you can see. So we took, you'll see the ribbons here are very much like the curtains and there's a lot of tassel and, you know, baubles and things that take their inspiration from the soft goods which in, within the room. And as a musical theme, there are trumpets and French horns and angels and cherubs playing instruments. I know, let's see if I can zoom in a little bit. This one, there's so much on the tree, it's hard to see any individual element. So there you are. So leaving the music room, not staring at the floor like it looks like I am, we're gonna move forward to what's one of the private rooms of the house. You know, the first floor of the house is really public rooms meant for entertaining and to make an impression of the importance and wealth of the Vanderbilts. But on the first floor, there's also the library, which is largely used as a family space, sort of the family room, if you will, although on a massive scale and very beautiful. Um, this room is um, darker. It has woodwork and circassian walnut, also known as English walnut. And then it is carved and stippled. I'll show you this panel here to look like leather. So that is actually all carved wood, but it's been stippled um, and gilded. It looks very much like the binding on a book instead of just gilded wood. And then there's another portrait here of the Commodore to the left. Here's a games table where you would have played bridge. Um, the tall case clock um, in the corner is a Vanderbilt piece from early on, family piece. The ceiling in this room, I think is best to show you in the main room. We've just been in the alcove. Here's the family library. Above the um, cornice, you see these green panels and those are all Spanish leather, which has been hand tooled and gilded. And then above the coffered ceiling, again, features inset panels with dolphins, mostly in florets that alternate. Um, there aren't as many uh, acorns in this room. However, all of these little detailed moldings along the edges of the moldings here are all actually acorns, if you look closely. And then the tree itself, we're gonna to go to the Christmas tree in the middle window, is all glass acorns hundreds and hundreds of glass acorns um, of different vintages. Uh, one thing I should mention is that this house being a summer house for the Vanderbilts was never decorated for the holidays. We don't do it in historic style because if we were, I think you'd be somewhat disappointed. Late 19th century holiday decorations were much simpler, not a lot of electric lights, lots of evergreens, lots of fruits um, and simple ribbon. Uh, so we tend to go a little bit over the top and do it in contemporary style but we try to do it in such a way that references the rooms and the family history somehow. So you can see all the great acorns on this tree. I'm especially proud of these acorns here, which if you come to visit in person, look very much like the hand tooling on the leather above the uh, cornice. So a lot of intensive shopping goes on, <laughs> which is one of my jobs. This room is very heavily furnished, um, more so than it normally would be. During the holiday season, we need to move furniture out of the Great Hall. And a lot of this furniture in the library is actually Great Hall furniture. So it looks a little bit, in my opinion, sort of garage sale at the moment. There's too much in the room. 
So moving out of the library, we're going to take a left and move back into the Great Hall. And to the right, um, there's another hearth, which I haven't really shown you. Um, it's sort of obscured by lots of poinsettias in Norfolk Island Pines at the moment. But in the corner of the Great Hall, we have a bust in white marble of Cornelius Vanderbilt II. We're going to go upstairs now to the second floor. Um, I wanted to point out on the right, you see some velvet curtains there. Every opening in the Great Hall was originally hung with these red velvet curtains with gold tassels. That was for two things, for controlling the breezes off the water, because as I mentioned, the glass doors would be open to the weather oftentimes, but also it was so you could gain a sense of privacy in any given room adjoining the Great Hall. Many of the curtains have been lost over time, um, you know, to age, basically. We've replaced them as, here and there as examples of what they would have been, but you can imagine uh, the project that would be to put back every velvet curtain that was once in this house. So we're going to proceed up the stairs. Um, you may notice that the stairs here are very shallow. Um, the rise to them is um, short and the depth of the stair is unusually deep. And that's actually for a reason. Um, a lot of Gilded Age clothing was restrictive and complicated, especially for women who were wearing gowns. And uh, so the stairs were always designed to be sort of shallow and easy to navigate. Um, in terms of decorating the house for Christmas, it's really annoying. You get very tired walking up and down shallow stairs. Um, you'll find. So here's the gallery view from the second floor into the Great Hall. Um, massive chandeliers also directly tied into the structure of the house, the steel structure of the house. I'm going to take you all around the second floor. Straight ahead, looking across, you get a better sense. The sun had come out, I think, by the time Sebastian started scanning the second floor. So in the distance here, that blue line, that's the Atlantic, that's the million dollar view, uh, the reason why this house was built in this location in the first place. And we'll actually get there in a few minutes. So this is floor number two. If you take a right off this main gallery hallway, we're going to be entering into Cornelius Vanderbilt's bedroom. So here we are. And it is a very large room. You'll notice that the decoration on the second floor is much simpler, um, more 18th century French and elegant, not over the top. Uh, it is by a different designer. It's Ogden Codman did the second floor. Um, he was um, not a formally trained architect, really. He came to prominence um, in the late 19th century. He was a Boston Brahmin of the Codman family. Uh, they had a house in Beacon Hill. They also had a, a country estate in Lincoln called the Grange, which is currently operated by Historic New England. So you can actually uh, visit the Grange. Uh, he was raised to say the least with a silver spoon and knew and took note of all finer things in life. And with Edith Wharton wrote a book called The Decoration of Houses in 1897, I believe, and was actually recommended by Edith Wharton, who was a friend of the Vanderbilt family to take on this commission, the bedrooms at the breakers on the second floor. So these rooms are actually fabricated in the US, I believe, and not in France and designed by Ogden Codman. And it's much more American in style, almost pared down uh, muted wall colors, putty colors a lot, uh, several shades of the same neutral tone in which you could mix and match furniture and fabrics um, from different eras. And so it's a much more um, contemporary approach. The theme within Mr. Vanderbilt's bedroom for Christmas decorating is trains um, to take note of New York Central Railroad and top hats because he was a magnet of the 19th century and lots of mixed plaids, all different types of plaid was the theme, because that's manly. So <clears throat> the Christmas tree follows that theme. Again, we have acorns. Believe me, it's not easy to find Argyle acorns, but we managed. And there are all sorts of different plaid ornaments on this tree as well. And top hats, the little black top hats like right there. Um, it was typical in this time period to use your bedroom as a living space, not just a sleeping chamber. That's why it's so large. You may have noticed the desk over to the right here. Um, this house being very formal didn't have a lot of hangout space. There was no kitchen island like today where you hung out with a flat screen TV. And you know, you know, during the daytime, if you needed to spend time uh, doing correspondence or just reading or whatever you were doing, oftentimes the bedroom functioned as that living space. It's more of a different outlook on life really. People wanted more privacy 
Uh, the same goes for Mrs. Vanderbilt's room. It was really a suite that allowed her to spend the day and not just to sleep at night. Now, a big part of Gilded Age society was clothing. And this is Mr. Vanderbilt's dressing room and his closet. Um, the Vanderbilts had California closets before anybody else. These closets are really well designed. They have sliding shelves and they even use um, all the ceiling space up above for hanging clothes. Um, women, especially in the Gilded Age, could change outfits up to seven times a day, depending on what functions they're attending or whether they're going to be seen in public or not. So clothes was a huge time constraint. It took up a lot of their time and a lot of their servants' times as well, keeping things clean and laundered and pressed, etc. Ogden Codman believed, if the designer of this space, that if something wasn't symmetrical, you should obscure it. And so the doors here you can see um, when they're closed, just disappear into the existing moldings and wood case work. Um, and so if something didn't directly align with another doorway or another window, he would have it disappear into the decorating scheme. And he felt very strongly about that. So very much a different approach than what was happening downstairs. We're going to enter into the shared bathroom. This was Mr. and Mrs. Vanderbilt's bathroom, his and hers, very large, however, um, all faced in Carrere marble. And the centerpiece of this bathroom is this sarcophagus-like bathtub out of one piece of stone. Um, while it's very impressive, it wasn't very practical. Um, the stone is so thick and so cold that they would have to fill it with hot water several times before being able to use it because otherwise you'd be sitting in very cold water. You'll notice that there are four sets of spigots here or two sets of spigots, hot and cold running water city water, and then hot and cold um, salt water that was taken in from the ocean and filtered. Um, in the late 19th century, they still believed that salt water or ocean water had curative effects. And so you could take a ocean water bath, and that was true of every bathroom, um, guest bathroom or family bathroom in the house, not servant bathroom. Uh, to the right, modern plumbing. There's a toilet and also a sits bath. We always on these tours get questions about you know, people think that's a foot bath, but it is actually the 19th century equivalent of a bidet. So there you go. So we're going to enter into Mrs. Vanderbilt's bedroom, which I think in many ways is more impressive than Mr. Vanderbilt's because in the end, uh, this was Mrs. Vanderbilt's house. She really ran the household. Mr. Vanderbilt was in New York during the week. He came to Newport on the weekends during the summer where she would have been a full-time resident and it was her job to run this house, which had 40 servants, hundreds of guests over the course of a summer and had everything from uh, you know, estate gardeners to chefs to servants who were upstairs and servants who were downstairs and servants in the kitchen. And it was her job to coordinate all of that. And she did that all from her bedroom. To the left of her bed here, and it's blocked by this COVID sign, I'm sorry, but there were a series of brass um, call buttons for the housemaid, the head housemaid, the butler, the site superintendent who would also run um, the gardening staff, um, the stable hand, the head stable hand who would bring the carriages up every day. It was really her job to make sure all of that was organized and it really was a full-time job. This was in addition to having seven children um, who ranged very much in age. Um, the Vanderbilt family was not without its share of tragedies. Uh, I think three of her children predeceased her maybe even four. So if you were to take the tour using the app, you'd learn all about how children were lost over the course of her lifetime. The tree in this room, to get to a happier subject, is all um, based on the red carpeting and it's all red blown glass cardinals and more acorns. In this case, the acorns um, have little cardinals and holly on them. We sort of corner the market in glass acorns uh, on the tour. Uh, here's a portrait of a son who died in uh, I think his freshman year at Yale. I'm sure he died of some, I'm not sure if it was TB, I think it was TB or scarlet fever. So very impressive room, oval in form. So in the dead spaces of the oval are dressing rooms. I'm gonna move you towards one of the dressing rooms. Again, this is Ogden Codman. He hid the door within the fabric wall covering and the moldings. Um, so this is one closet and there are two more outside the room to either side and it's actually one more I think to the right even in this room. She had massive amounts of clothing uh, because of her 
position as a society hostess. Uh, I may, yeah, I think there is a hidden door there as well. So lots of closet space and all of them very well designed to hold gowns and daytime wear, et cetera, et cetera. So we're gonna spin around and head down the hallway. I think you can see on the right here that there's a number two on that door. All of the, this house is massive and all of the bedrooms are numbered. And I think that was for the sake, not only of guests, but for the sake of servants. Uh, you wouldn't necessarily know who's occupying any given bedroom. If they weren't a family member, they could be a guest. These particular rooms I'm showing you today are family bedrooms and would have had uh, the same residents all the time. But there were so many other rooms that the rooms need to be numbered very much like a hotel. So we're going to take a right into this bathroom, which was shared between uh, Mrs. Vanderbilt's maids who occupied this room adjacent to Mrs. Vanderbilt's. And on the other side, we have Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney's bedroom, which really had a prime spot in the house. Gertrude's, Gertrude was really considered an important member of the family. She was the eldest daughter of Cornelius and Alice. And she was sort of an amazing woman. Um, she wasn't just your typical 19th century woman who wanted to grow up to be married and to run a household. She wanted to have a career and she ended up having quite a successful career as a sculptress. And um, on either side of the Christmas tree here, there are examples, photographs of her work in sculpture. She is also the founder of the Whitney Museum in New York. And she ended up marrying Harry Payne Whitney, who was also an heir to a major fortune. And um, they were married in the music room I showed you earlier. She also had her coming out party, um, her debutante ball here at the Breakers in 1895. She led more of a bohemian lifestyle, very artistic, very creative. She had a studio in New York, a home on Long Island, and she was really um, part of creative society in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Very impressive woman. By the way, I should mention, we have an exhibition about Vanderbilt women, which is currently closed, but because of the winter time, but it will be reopening in March. It's at Rosecliff. Um, and it profiles four Vanderbilt women and Gertrude is among them. So if you wanna learn more about the women of the Vanderbilt family, um, please visit our website and see the dates of opening uh, for March. So I'm gonna bring you into, I think my favorite part of the house and that's the upper loggia. So this is why this house was built where it is on Ochre Point. It's this amazing view of the Atlantic. So this is an open air pavilion uh, which would have been used by the family members, this being the bedroom floor, as sort of an outdoor living room. And uh, you're seeing it bare in the wintertime. Uh, in the summer months, it would have been completely furnished with wicker furniture, tables, chairs, everything uh, to make it comfortable and sort of a hangout space. Opposite, we have more glass doors, which would be thrown open to the Great Hall. Strangely enough, we are still keeping this space open and the glass doors open to the Great Hall because of COVID. Normally we would enclose this space for the winter and actually have um, a holiday setup of the Vanderbilt reproduction toy trains, which is a big display. We can't do that this year because we have this space open to the air uh, and open to the Great Hall for COVID regimens. So, but uh, the ceiling here is really neat. It's painted, faux painted as um, Turkish tents, as if it were strung up as like a Sheikh's tent up in the desert or something like that. And the floor is actually mosaic tile again, very similar to the mosaic in the billiards room, but in different patterns. No acorns here. There must be acorns somewhere, but not on the floor. Now, if you were lucky enough to be a guest of the Vanderbilts, you would stay in this guest suite off the upper loggia. Again, this is Ogden Codman design, um, a little bit fancier than the other bedrooms because it was a guest room. So more carving, but again, a very simple sort of poly putty colored wall color painted, um, not as much gilding as downstairs. And these inset panels with celadon green panels or murals in them. So the holiday decorating scheme here is also green and putty. So here's the mantelpiece with these seasonal angels and green candles and all sorts of shades of jade green and silver acorns within the garland. So very restrained. We try to make each holiday decorating scheme a little bit different to appeal to different tastes. The tree here is, again, cherubs uh, in green, and lots of green um, compliments. What you can't see 
photographs don't always show everything. I think the trees actually show up better in person, but this one actually has um, moth-blown icicles on them, which are the same shade of green as the inset panels on the wall. So it actually is much more effective in person, I think. All right, we're gonna head into one final bathroom before we head out back into the Great Hall area. Again, a paneled bathroom with hidden doors. You'll notice that the guests do not get a stone bathtub in this case, they get porcelain. So I guess that's one way they didn't rank as family did. And we're gonna head back out into the gallery on the second floor. And this is the upper portion of the grand staircase. Um, I'm gonna move you towards the center bay and look over across the Great Hall. Whoops. And directly opposite is Mrs. Vanderbilt's bedroom. So you can see what a commanding presence her bedroom was. She was overlooking the Great Hall, sort of in the most prominent position because this was a house built for her really by her husband. And opposite, we have one of the great masterpieces within the museum collection. People think of us as an historic house organization, but we have over 55,000 objects within our collections. And one of the premier objects is the uh, Vander, I'm gonna do this backwards, the Van Mander tapestry, <laughs> which is a 17th century Flemish tapestry. It's one in a series of nine. This one in particular um, shows Alexander the Great after his victory at Isis. I had to look that up, um, obviously. But what you're actually looking at is a digital reproduction of this tapestry because the original is currently in, um, I wanna say Flanders, but no, Belgium uh, being conserved. And it's going to be returned to us after, I think 18 months of conservation uh, this winter and it will be rehung in this spot. I think the digital representation is pretty spot on though. This on the left is a portrait of the Commodore. And on the right, his son, William Vanderbilt, the father of Cornelius. And down below, looking over the railing, um, I can show you there is the portrait of Mrs. Vanderbilt, Cornelius's wife, Alice. And that is a Madrazo, Spanish painter Madrazo portrait. There were three Madrazos. I believe that was the grandson, but don't quote me on that. Again, landscape guy, not an art guy. So I'm gonna take you back down the staircase we um, came up. Uh, on the right, I just wanted to point out, there's our little Otis Company elevator, which is original to the property. It's closet sized. It would have been used uh, by the family, also by the butler, uh, also by elderly guests um, to the house. And then this blue ceiling up above, I've always found this curious. There's only one panel on the second floor gallery that is painted this way with this azure blue painting in gold leaf, sort of medallion motif. I think that's so that you could tell from the Great Hall where the staircase was, the interior staircase, but I could be wrong. Um, I just find that curious. So we're gonna head back down the staircase now, back into the vestibule. And that sort of concludes our holiday tour. As I mentioned, there are actually uh, four floors to the breakers. The third floor is a servant floor and it is not currently part of the public tour. And um, Sebastian has actually scanned that floor. I think he holds the record for um, a lecture for us having shown that third floor scan um, last fall. Mm -hmm. And I think we had over 600 res uh, registrants for that because that had never been shown publicly before. And we are right now trying to figure out how to show that third floor, which is half Vanderbilt family, half servant, uh, accommodations uh, for the general public. So that'll be coming online within the next couple of years or so. So and that concludes our holiday tour of the first and second floors. I think I wanted to go 45 minutes and I went probably about 45 minutes, but I think we do have time for a couple questions. So Jody, take it away. Well, thank you so much, Jim. This has been just such a unique inside up close look that has been fantastic. Um, so we have a couple questions. First, Diane asks uh, about if you could estimate it, how long do you say it takes to decorate for the holidays? Uh, typically, I start around Columbus Day and we open up the week before Thanksgiving. So four to six weeks when I'm doing three houses. This year we did two houses. So I was able to cut that installation time down to four weeks. Generally, it's about a week and a half at the Elms and two and a half weeks at the Breakers. 
Um, takedown, of course, is much quicker. I can usually get everything taken down off the floor in about a week or so, but then it takes an additional week or two to crate it and label it. It's almost more important to put it away neatly so you can find everything the following year than it is how you put it up. But So uh, this year was about a month, and that was with the help of all of our four research fellows. We also had help from our gardens and grounds crew, our maintenance department, so it was really an all-hands on deck sort of experience. Very cool. Um, do the walls and ceilings ever need to be refinished? I think you touched on this with the curtains and the, especially the, the artwork that you were just mentioning. Well, um, it's an ongoing, curating a house like this is just 24 seven year after year after year. Um, I had said the walls are of Indiana limestone, but they also have in many rooms a covering coat of paint, which needs to be cleaned. If you look to the lower left on this corner piece of this column below the light fixture, you'll see like a darkened portion, probably where people's hands have touched as they pass by. Um, that would get cleaned. Um, that gets into a whole area of conservatorship, conservation that I know very little about. I see a lot of it happening. I think that would be a good topic for a return lecture for the MIT crowd. Um, but I can tell you that the painted finishes, say, on the ceiling have never been touched. I think the mural of the clouds up above, which is meant to connote open air, may have been touched. But in the case of the breakers, the house went directly from family hands into the hands of the Preservation Society and has been consistently conserved since 1972. In addition, the house is usually completely climate controlled. Uh, three years ago, we installed a geothermal system, which helps us to maintain uh, as close to perfect interior conditions as we can have. Um, a lot of that has been unfortunately interrupted by COVID because we have to open the windows now. Um, but um, it's just an ongoing huge project. Yes, things are constantly being conserved and repainted, chips being repaired, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Wow. We will probably take you up on that follow-up talk. <laughs> Um, before we keep going, I want to mention uh, to anyone listening, we are recording this talk and we will have it available on our, our MyTAC YouTube channel if you do have to head out at three, but we will keep going if that's all right with you, Jim. Sure. Um, Belinda asks where you store the decorations off season and do you take pictures to document and archive uh, what it looks like every year? So actually at the breakers, there is a massive attic um, on the fourth floor and everything in the breakers gets stored in that attic. Um, one of these days soon, once the servant life tour at the breakers of the third floor is open, we are also considering opening up the parts of the attic to the general public because it shows uh, Richard Morris Hunt's structural steel construction, which is very contemporary. You can see the steel beams in the attic and how the stone was attached to it. And so we think that's worth seeing which means I would need to move everything out of the attic, which is a day I'm not looking forward to. Um, mm -hmm. We do rent um, storage lockers at one of those, you know, U-Haul uh, uh, office park sort of storage spaces where I keep a lot of the Christmas trees and a lot of the decorations. What we really lack within the Preservation Society is centralized storage. It's something that's on our wish list that we would have a warehouse somewhere where conservation takes place and furniture gets stored and Christmas gets stored. We don't currently have that. So I individually store um, Christmas decorations at each house. At the Elms, I have a former bathroom that is not on the tour that gets used as Christmas storage. And at Marble House, uh, when we're decorating Marble House, um, I use the basement, which is not weather tight, nor is it climate controlled. So the storage situation is not ideal. Mm -hmm. As for documenting, I do photograph every room every year and I take notes of what works and what did not work I think what's more important is that things get stored um, in a way that I can identify it room by room. All the rooms are stored separately in separate bins, which are stacked together. So if I were hit by a truck or whatever happens and I'm not doing this next year, someone should be able to look at the photographs and um, look at the bins and understand what's happening in each room. However, it's our goal to have it be different every year to a certain degree because we do get return visits this has become a tradition for many people to come back every year. And so it's nice if it is slightly different every year. Very cool. Elda asks if there are any sort of uh, special books in the library, many, maybe any old or original cookbooks or anything of that sort. Cookbooks, I'm not so sure. Family books from the Vanderbilts, yes. Um, 
a little bit outside my purview, but if you come and do the tour using the app, you will be able to look into the bookcases. There are original volumes there that are leather bound and that did belong to the Vanderbilt family. I'd be hard pressed to give you any titles, however. <laughs> um, Anthony asks, where do you find the most success shopping for these decorations, antique shops? And are there any trips abroad for Argyle acorns? <laughs> I wish there were trips abroad. <laughs> no, I've never had the company funded trip abroad. No, um, basically all of the seasonal decorations, um, mostly I have found at holiday trade shows. I don't venture into antique shops. I don't have the time, nor do I use retail. Everything is bought wholesale from vendors. I particularly use the Atlanta Mart in January if you've never been to Atlanta Mart, it's a wholesale market in like three skyscrapers in downtown. Atlanta is absolutely massive. Um, just floors and floors and floors of holiday decorations. And mostly what I do is I photograph each room. I go to that trade show and I follow themes. I will have pre-looked at catalogs from vendors. And then I go to visit the showrooms to see the things in person. Uh, and from year to year, I try to build collections for each room, you know, for instance, Argyle acorns for Mr. Vanderbilt's room. And generally, I don't know how I'm making all of these little green lines, Sebastian, but <laughs> I'm just skilled technically, as you can tell, but disregard those green lines. Um, so basically it's just a lot of, like, it's exhausting. I do three days of just Christmas every January, right after we close here, there's a Christmas show, usually around January 6th or January 8th. I'm not going this year because our budget has been slashed, but the last thing I really want to do after taking down Christmas is going shopping for Christmas, but that's what we do. <laughs> <laughs> um, and just a reminder, if anyone has any last minute questions, you can write them right in the chat. Um, otherwise, Shirley asks, how many servants were there living at the Breaker's house? 40, give or take. Wow. Um, and some servants stayed year round. The caretaker who lived on site stayed with his family. Um, you don't really completely shut a house like this down. You still operate it even in the months the family is not here. But the vast majority of the servants came with them. Of course, they owned a railroad, so that wasn't a problem. You just pack everyone up on a train and bring them. They also brought with them uh, the family silver, uh, their wardrobes for the summer. Uh, it was a huge operation to move from residence to residence. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Jim. It looks like those are all of our questions at the moment. Great. Um, this has been such a wonderful presentation. Um, such a beautiful inside look. All Thank right. You. Well, happy holidays, everyone. <laughs>